All right, next up we have one half of the Chicago sketch comedy troupe, Rabbit Rabbit. This is Rabbit. Or Andrew Bentley, sorry, Andrew Bentley. Hey. <laughs> All right, I'm, uh, I'm going to put on a t-shirt. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right here. Uh, this is an Iron Maiden t-shirt. Yeah, for those of you on the podcast, uh, if you go to Google and you type in Iron Maiden and Wicker Man, uh, you should get an idea of the shirt I'm wearing here. Uh, this shirt was my favorite shirt when I was in 10th grade. Uh, at 10th grade, it may go without saying, uh, was not the year I lost my virginity. <laughs> uh, rather, uh, it was the year my battered blue disc man saw a perpetual rotation of Iron Maiden, Megadeth, and Halloween albums, punctuated by the occasional burnt CD from my LimeWire using friends, which would install some new figure of interest in my ever-expanding pantheon of bombastic leather-clad Europeans. <laughs> Gamma Ray, Hammerfall, Sonata Arctica, Stradivarius, uh, each of these found a place in the soundtrack to my daily school bus commute. Prior to high school, my musical tastes had been more or less non-existent. Basically, Weird Al, Primus, whatever my sister happened to play through the walls of our bedrooms, and some old tapes, mostly musical soundtracks, my mom had thoughtlessly deposited with me years earlier, heedless of the social repercussions for a 13-year-old boy who, unironically, knows all the lyrics to Cats. <laughs> the magical Mr. Mistopheles may be able to make a knife or fork disappear, but he cannot do the same for an A-cup bra. <laughs> and, yet, I, uh, and yet I was destined to take my musical castration one step further, because in 2001, my friend Chris Rory's introduced me to Iron Maiden. I was skeptical at first, but this was Chris Rory's, whose track record included my first exposure to porn, D&D, firearms, and casual arson, all of which turned out to be pretty awesome. So I relented. The album was Brave New World, the first track, Wicker Man. I can't say I was converted on that first song, but the album is 72 minutes long, and by the end, I had been raptured into a new realm of musical appreciation. Now, to remind you all, the competition was not steep. Uh, this was 2001, a year when the list of bands burning up the radio included Crazy Town, Shaggy, Uncle Cracker, Creed, and, according to the internet, Train? I... I, I don't know either, but apparently we loved it. Uh, hey, soul sister. <laughs> uh, at, at that point in my life, I owned easily less than 10 CDs. By the end of high school, the number was closer to 200. Overnight, I became a metalhead, a true believer, a jean-clad evangelist diligently hunched over Roxy OCD creator, crafting the perfect mix which would similarly lift the scales from the eyes of my benighted cohorts. <laughs> I had many loves. Iced Earth, with their 24-minute, three-track trilogy, cataloging a blow-by-blow -blow account of the three-day Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, Hammerfall, whose music revolved around the seemingly earnest belief that they were reincarnated Knights Templar, sworn to combat some undefined evil. Megadeth, whose frontman, Dave Mustaine, filled the space between his anti-government screeds with what sounded like the orgasmic grunts of a long-time emphysema patient. Stradivarius, perhaps the only charting band in history to have not one but two members named Timo, and whose adorable grasp of the English language led them to pen the lines, I know your name, you're called Mr. Mean, one thing I found out, you don't know beans. But... But throughout it all, my greatest love remained Iron Maiden. Uh, to those of you who know a little something about metal, my preferred school of the genre should by now be obvious. Power metal. If you're not familiar with the term, banish all thoughts of corpse-painted church board earners or whiskey-drenched homoeroticism. <laughs> Hair metal might wear the lipstick, but power metal has the labia. <laughs> let, let me explain. Uh, <clears throat> Well, for sure, some of it is po-faced balladry about dragon slaying and evil wizards, but the good stuff is surprisingly familiar material. Love, loss, longing. Much of it dealt with in an introspective and vulnerable way. And then there's the joyful, heartfelt, over-the-top presentation. To tell the truth, it's not that great a leap I made from Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> Power metal is basically show tunes with more guitar solos, double bass drums, and Scandinavians. <laughs> Unless the show in question is Mamma Mia, in which case, 
equal Scandinavians. Uh, the two forms share a love of soaring ballads, upbeat refrains, and theatricality. Uh, power metal's unvarnished torrent of awkward sincerity evokes the traditional conceit of musical theater, escalation to lyricism when the emotional content becomes too great for speech. Rent and Machines of Mental Design by Guardians of Time share all the same existential ruminations on mortality and identity. If you replace the AIDS with an insane CEO trying to achieve immortality by bonding with a self-aware global computer system, the two are practically identical. <laughs> I can poke all the fun I want at the ridiculous aesthetics of the genre, at its unmarketability, at the way most of their accents destroy the short I sound, universe, helicopter, etc. <laughs> but the fact remains, the music affects me, and with greater significance than their more respectable contemporaries. My musical taste these days is far more diverse, and some of the old classics don't get much play on my iTunes, but I still shiver when I hear the piano from Abandoned or the final sustain from the end of this chapter. I don't wear my Iron Maiden shirts. I have four. <laughs> anymore. But Bruce Dickinson is still one of my idols, not just for Iron Maiden, for the other things he's done, for being an Olympic-level fencer and the author of the children's series Lord Iffy Boat Race and a licensed 747 pilot who voluntarily flew Lebanese refugees out of the war zone to Cyprus during the 2006 Israel-Hezbollah conflict. Yeah. <laughs> but most of all, for doing what he loved, well after it stopped being cool. For many of these artists, what they do was a laughing stock before they even signed to a label. But they do it anyway, because it means something to them, and it means something to their fans. We're both nerds, but... Long before that became a common point of pride, they had embraced it. And their music reached something in a 14-year-old who was more interested in songs about Aldous Huxley in the movie Predator than he was in Getting Laid. So, while I'm about to change out of this shirt, because it's ill-fitting and gaudy, I'm not going to throw it away. And I feel okay saying Iron Maiden's Final Frontier was one of the best new albums I heard last year. Because it was. It's not for everyone, but it's for me. And that's what music's about, right? That and Rum Tum Tugger. <laughs> Thank you.